Welcome, welcome. It's Wednesday, January 31st, and this is Wisecrack Live. Thanks for joining us, chat. As you can see, we're a bit early today. We're going to roll for a little, and then Mike will be right with us. We got a lot to talk about, and uh, we're going to have some guests on, so uh, it's going to be a fun one, guys. Be right back. Jackson, the politics understander, is here in the chat. Yeah, that's the secret 1% of Jackson you have to uh, get behind their Patreon for. Master, I was taken by surprise by a grain of salt. Uh, we'll ponder that today, I guess. What's up, Storm XLR? And only Storm XLR. This is Wisecrack Live on Wednesday, January 31st. As Gregoria pointed out in the chat already, the last day of dry January. So for those of you doing dry January, enjoy your last day of ritualistic sobriety. Um, but hello to everyone out there in the world, out of the world, in their head, outside of their head, embodied, disembodied digitized, automated, commercialized, monetized, all the various ways we're able to exist in a culture where the only way to exist is to have your identity be capable of creating data sets that can be monetizable for a small group of people that work for a small set of companies that largely make money in speculative fashions while you toil away for nothing. It's so good to see you. It's a beautiful day here in Los Angeles, California. I looked out the window to check if what I just said is valid. It's a little it's a little gloomy, but it's still fine. But hey, it's great to be with you all. Thanks for tuning in live. Eddie just finished teaching and he's ready to hang out. Uh, Eddie, good to see you as always. Uh, you know, good to see you all here. So quick rundown of what we're going to do today. Oh, and again, um, it's Wisecrack Live. My name is Michael Burns. I'm joined by producer Henry as always. We're here to hang out for the next couple of hours. Um, oh, sorry to hear oh, no. Matthew. But yeah, go ahead. Matthew. You're still allowed to like the stim. So sorry, Matthew. I just had I just had that thing as well, Matthew. So I'm I'm right there with you. Is all that I I will say. I'm right there with you. Um. So yeah, we're going to talk about a lot today. I want to talk about um a a a, tw a Twitter X thread by Hank Green, one of the OGs of white guys saying stuff on YouTube. Um, I didn't mean that in a disrespectful way because I'm a white guy who says stuff on YouTube. It is what it is. Um. But, you know, made some comments about housing and politics and this magical um, thing called like online activism and like the left. And it's this thing people say, but I don't know if they know what they're saying. So I want to talk about that a little bit. Uh, we're also going to be joined in the second hour by Udelia Travis, a uh, very funny, smart, interesting comedian, performer and writer based based in New York. Uh, might know him as well from his YouTube show, Jaded Forum, which is one of my favorite things. I think it's, they said it's coming back. So hopefully it's coming back. And yeah, we're not here to, we're not here to hate on Hank Green. You know, we're not here to hate. It just is what it is. But we're going to talk about housing. Um, so 
a couple more things before we get started. This is a weird case where we have, we have a video on the channel uh, that's coming out right now. It's it's a video that, that Butterfinger paid for. Butterfinger did not pay for this stream, so I'm actually not going to say the name of that company anymore or ever again. Because if you want to say if you want me to say the name of your company, you got to pay me money. That's how it works. Um, but thanks for being here and, and not watching that. Watch it later, but not right now. Uh, we had a video that came out Friday that, you know, I'll be blunt with you all. Um, wow, Jackson with the hate for Nueva York. Um, no one really watched the video that came out Friday. It's on, on plagiarism. But it's not really on plagiarism. Sort of that scandal that happened, of course, with Neri Oxman and Claudine Gay um, and, you know, little Italian-American Nazi Christopher Rufo. I think there's some interesting stuff there. If you haven't checked the video out, you can check it out, you know, now. Um, but you can check that out later. Got some other good stuff coming out for you as well. Just a reminder that in 2024, we're doing a lot of new stuff on Patreon. Yesterday, we did our first Patreon gaming session. We're going to do this on months that have five weeks. And producer Henry was there and won one of the rounds. Uh, Director Lux led us in some quiplash. I think a couple of you who are in the chat now played with us. That was fun, right, Henry? Did you have did you have a nice time? Yes, that was extremely fun. Great. I realized I forgot to post the link uh, to the stream on our Discord server. I'm going to do that right now. Um, but again, we have a Discord server. Uh, you could be on the Discord server if you are a member of that Patreon community that we referenced before. So check that out if you want. Uh, we did a game day yesterday. I put out a special uh, philosophy office hours video um, last week. And we have a bunch more stuff coming. Olivia's putting together a super cut of outtakes from, from last year of filming videos where I say things that I could probably get fired or canceled for. So be on the lookout for that. And then our head of editorial, Amanda and Lux are doing a little podcast where Amanda is going to dig in, into some of the research stuff she hasn't been able to touch on in videos. So, you know, check that out. Punk Rock Reverend keeps talking about a Serbian film. I still don't know what that is. I'll look into it, but I'm not excited about it. Um, it's, it's, it's always an extremely wonderful oh, piece of satire. It's quite extreme, okay. though. I, I, I'd be okay. curious to host a, host a screening sometime. I know I don't like extreme stuff all the time unless it's like, you know, early 2000s X Games rollerblading videos. Um, you know, our buddy Jackson's in the chat. We love when Jackson's in the chat. Jackson, who's been on this show before. Jackson was on the most controversial episode ever of Wisecrack Live. Jackson comes on this show once. And next thing I know, there's people on Twitter talking about how Jackson and I are, are bad. We're our bad boys, our bad guys. Um, but check out Skip Intro. Truly one of my favorite channels on YouTube. I got to write about it, which was really fun. Hopefully I get to write about Skip Intro again at some other point. Um, but please do check it out. Uh, consider subscribing to his Patreon. Also, I'm curious what in the chat thinks about this. A new thing, because I want to be more like, you know, producer Henry. I'm trying to like reteach myself video editing. So I think for fun, I might make a few videos that I just post on my own channel where I do some of the really boring, long philosophy deep dives we yeah. can't really do on YouTube. If any of you think that would be fun, let me know. I, my goal, if a hundred people watched it, I would feel real happy, but I was thinking of making some videos. Yeah. Where I just kind of like dig in. Um, there are a few videos on my channel already from COVID times where I went through some Young Hill Chan, uh, uh, Young Hill Chan books together um, with some people, but I don't know. I'm thinking of trying that. I don't, I wouldn't be doing it for like, any other reason than for fun, but it'd be fun if a few people were interested in that, but yeah. So, you know, got to get those editing chops back. So, um, and as always, you know, check out our Patreon, watch our videos, all that sort of stuff. Penny, if Penny will watch it, then I'll make it. Um, okay. Let's look at some comments from last week's videos. Um, start with some academic plagiarism ones. Oh yeah. It okay, strikes me, me that the those. people that did watch that video appreciated it a lot. I hope some of them were mad though. Um, okay. I did appreciate the people. So some people were just like very, well, let's just look at the comments. Look at the comments. So this is from the plagiarism video. Is the first one you have up that we are doing? Self. Oh, okay. I got it. Okay. Self-generated podcast says, even though it's mainly politics, 
Leading the charge on the discussion, these examples of plagiarism opens the door to a larger conversation about the state of our educational institutions. It's becoming clear that plagiarism, along with the replication crisis, the primitive cost and inaccessibility of education, the awful collective treatment of associate professors, and the hyper-politicization of academic environments are not separate issues, but rather interconnected signs of a systemic problem. The education system as it stands seems to be diverging from its intended purpose and ideals. Wow, that's a good one. I know some people in our chat right now. I know at least Eddie's here, who's a, a, a university professor. Uh, you know, Dr. Chris Maverick will probably watch this later. He's teaching right now. But yeah, guys, the state of education is weird. It, it's bad. You know, it's a system that, I mean, I think something that a lot of people don't realize is that the people that run universities these days are not academics, they're not scholars, they're not teachers, they're not folks that work their way up the ranks. A lot of them are like consultants and business folks and dudes with MBAs that were brought into universities to make them more profitable and efficient. Now, I don't know, I don't know everything there is to know about the history of the modern university, but I do know that profitability efficiency, optimization are not words normally associated with the teleology of education. And I think that when you have business bros, for lack of a better term, running educational institutions, bad stuff happens. I've used this anecdote before, but in my last teaching job, there was a second year course on um, Immanuel Kant's third critique and admin requested that one of my colleagues work a segment into that course that taught students how to write resumes and make PowerPoints um, about their like, you know, career desires and stuff like that, which is insane. That's an insane thing to do with that same university. Our funding as our department was evaluated by how many of our students that graduated with a philosophy degree um, within a year had full-time employment but full-time employment was like a career job. So for example, if you got a philosophy degree from the university I taught at, and let's say for a year or two, you're like, I'm going to work in a cafe or a pub, do some reading, hang out, maybe go to grad school, maybe not. That didn't count as a real job. So that meant that, that we weren't setting students up for success. And then our department got less money. Uh, so, you know, that, that's what things are like in that world right now. So I think that considering some of the issues that are happening on campuses right now, devoid of that context, might miss the point. Is the next comment for you the one from Momo UL something? Great. This one says, the more I go through with my PhD, the more I begin to understand I don't really have a chance in getting an academic career. You know, I don't want to be negative in this one, but it's so hard, you know? I, I tried to have an academic career. I pieced one together for a little bit. But it was hard enough to where, you know, I was in a position where it was either live in, in another country and have an academic career or get to live in a place with like my wife and friends and family and have to find a new career, which is tough. You know, it's tough. I remember as well, when I first started telling my mom, I remember like starting salaries for academic jobs. She thought I was wrong. She was like, there's no, there's no way you have a PhD. And that's all they pay you. But, you know, the first job I had, uh, I made $45,000 a year. Um, and, you know, it, it, was, I, it was in a cheaper city. I had some solid benefits and time off. But the amount of, of, of education you and debt you go into and, and, you know, years of adjunct teaching and stuff to end up in a job where you make less than like the manager of a Chipotle. And I'm not hating on managers of Chipotles. Shout out to you. It's just wild. Um, so, you know, solidarity to everyone who's, who's out there on the academic grind. Tell me what the next one for you is. Great. Draco says, we're doing more consuming than creating, so novel ideals become harder to come by. Yeah, I think that's true. Um, and I think this, this matters when we think about things like plagiarism. Um, and I do think... So I'm coming around to something right now that is maybe a little overly spicy. I'm coming around to think that some of the discourse around the H bomber guy video is overblown. That's what I'm coming around to. And I'll tell this to all of you. Um, you know, it's okay Ooh. to change your mind. It's okay to let your thoughts develop. It's okay to, you know, it's just okay. What's, uh, um, what's going on with your thought process there? I haven't really uh, dug into a lot of the follow-up 
but I'm curious. Well, I think it just led to this militancy where, you know, at least people on the H Bomber guy Reddit are just, they're just witch hunting. They're just like witch hunting. And I do kind of think that so much of, I think that a lot of people on YouTube, and I, I am guilty of the thing I'm going to talk about right now before anyone says anything. But most YouTube comment is just repurposed content from other people. Most of it. You know, you get reaction videos. You get videos where people paraphrase other people's ideas for you. You get videos where people talk about movies or games that other people made for you. You get videos where people take a bunch of content other people made, repackages, uh, uh, repackage that as their own. You know, it's a platform that, is driven by, and you know, all digital media these days is driven by repurposed content. You know, there was a a call I was on recently where someone was talking about like TikTok and, um, you know, Snapchat channels that make lists. And, and, you know, there's this whole brand of content, and you all know this, right? Where it's like the top 10 blanks. But the reason that format exists is so that people can just take content from other people, repackage it, make it for themselves, get clicks and try to get ad revenue off of it. And I think that, most digital platforms are not platforms that encourage and reward creativity. They, they reward a type of like consumption and the, and the creation of a further desire for consumption. Yeah. So I think to look at this is like, to, I, I just think to look at the plagiarism thing as this cut and dry moral thing might be missing out on a larger context. I have uh, of the digital creator economy. Uh, yeah, I think I have two things I want to say in response to that because uh, I see where you're coming from, and I do agree with like the witch hunting tendencies of like uh, over over determining plagiarism online. I think in the H bomber video case, the specificity of its targets was that they were in some way beyond just like lazy plagiarism, uh, profiting yeah. off of people and uh, abusing people in their like uh, social presence. Um, but also to get back to the comment that I selected uh, and that started this, uh, the whole the novelty of consumption and the need for like newer and fresher ideas, I think is kind of a matter of what a person expects or uh, orients their uh, their goals of media consumption around. Because, you know, you can chase it for dopamine or like narrative highs or like maximalizing escapism but is that like the ultimate point of what what these things are made for uh or is yeah. that kind of more about like what the consumer's trying to do with it yeah i then i think we're still figuring out what these platforms and things are for i don't even know i don't know anymore I'm, I'm kind of having i'm currently going through a bit of a crisis uh internally about what the point of making stuff is you know what the point of like all these platforms are, I won't go any further, but I'm going through it. You know, guys, I'm going through some, I'm, I'm thinking too much right now. I do the next feel, comment from, oh, uh, go ahead. I do feel we're at a point where we're sort of getting redundant with the messaging to where like, I don't question maybe just the complete reality of like what these things are for, but it's more like, okay, we've been re re remaking the same message over and over and over and over again. What's like the root repetition here? Why aren't we addressing it? And I think that gets beyond, uh, you know, pop culture itself and more into yeah. the political and economic. Uh, um, this next comment, I think the last one I have to read cause it references Babylon. Um, this person says, I'll admit it. I only watched Babylon on your recommendation. And while I definitely walked away and joined, I think my opinion of the movie has only gone up the longer I've sat with it and continued to think about it. I'll never stop saying this, guys. Babylon's a really interesting movie that tries to do something interesting, and it, in many ways, skewers the economic structures built around the production of art. And yeah. I don't think it does it perfectly, but I think it, I think it goes for it in a way. And I think that Damien Chazelle has been punished for making that movie. He's not allowed to direct anymore. He's currently in director jail. He like got to write a script for something recently. And I just think he went down. I just think he's someone who saw the tea leaves. He saw what's happening in Hollywood. Hollywood only think that way. I think directly over there is where the Hollywood sign is. Um, He saw what's happening and was like, this is my last chance to get a bunch of money and do something. And he did it, you know, so good for him. And then for me to say that is huge because I I hate that guy because he made a movie about how uh, oh, how, how a white guy saved to jazz. Um, I disagree with the reading of La La Land. We're going to talk, we, we're going to do, let's, let's bookmark this for maybe like a Monday stream sometime where we'll just talk about that. Okay. We could talk about Bob, yeah, La La Land and yeah. Babylon. 
Yeah. Um, uh, it goes on to say, conversely, I was so excited for Dream Scenario. I came to an indie theater for a weekend in Manchester City, and I felt like they fumbled an incredible idea. Exact same feeling. I was so excited to see Dream Scenario, and it sucked. Um, it sucked. As I, I mean, I, I wish I could be a little more subtle here, but but as a movie, it sucked. I didn't like it. Um, oh, let's see. Beatmaster says, Michael, define repurposing. You mean in general, building upon advancing and remixing? Great question, Beatmaster. Okay, so I'm going to define two different things. In one hand, we can repurpose other art. I mean, think about it this way. Let's talk about jazz music. If you go see a good jazz performance, you're very likely to see artists playing songs that might not be original compositions. They're probably from the, the real book, which is the name given to the collection of jazz standards that's sort of the canon of, of that sort of music. But when really good musicians take those songs, they're taking a pre-existing structure and they're injecting creativity and originality with it. They're pushing on the boundaries of that which already exists. Um, and they're doing something really cool with it. The same way that a lot of music production that samples other artists, they're not just copying what they're doing. They're using pre-existing media as a building block for something new. And in many ways, they're pushing the boundaries of that thing. I think that the lines get blurry when people more or less do this like casual reappropriation of ideas. Um, when they present ideas and concepts as their own, when they maybe read a book and rather than critically interacting with it, they just present the ideas from the thing in this like organic way. Um, and, and I think there's also an idea of motivation. I think there is a tendency in the digital media structures that exist to reward people for making shit that they think is the shit that people want to see. So, you know, um, I do want to get into what's up, Clayton. Glad that you're here. And hey, everyone in the chat, very glad you're here. Um, I like that you're talking. I like that you're hanging. You know, know that you can always gift uh, memberships if you want. If you do gift memberships, um, then you become Lord of the Chat. Uh, a couple of things, too. Uh, we're going to try to toy with some of the membership perks as well. I only recently learned that we can do members only streams um, and other stuff. So we're going to toy with that as well. So thank you again for supporting the channel. It helps us a lot. So let's talk about our, our main hour one topic. Um, let's talk about Hank Green. Um, and let's, you know, let's just start with this. I'm not here to say that Hank Green is canceled or that he's, he's bad or he's the enemy. Hank Green is someone that has done a lot of work to stick up for, to defend, to, to sort of cultivate a community of people that create stuff on this platform and has, you know, pushed back against YouTube in a lot of ways, started VidCon, has done a lot of cool stuff. Most of Hank Green, of course, is, uh, you know, is the, the vlog brothers have done a lot of work over the years to try to earnestly explore big ideas. And I would never take anything away from that. And there are far worse people on this platform, right? But I almost think it's more interesting sometimes, or maybe even more, <coughs> to break down why people who we kind of like are wrong. And I'll tell you why. If I was going to tell you right now, like, uh, you know, friggin' Ben Shapiro said something dumb about politics, it would be like, yeah, of course he did. Let's roast him. This is fun. Ben Shapiro, great rap artist, by the way. Um, I would rather get my eyes eaten out by the disembodied skull of my dad being puppeted by my worst enemy uh, than watch that video. But, um, you know, that's like, it's fun to roast people who have bad ideas that we know have bad ideas. It's, it's often more instructive to look at people who often have good ideas, whose intent we believe is good. And I do believe that someone like Hank Green has good intent and figure out why they think something or why they're getting at something it's maybe bad. It's maybe wrong. And so Hank Green um, had a, a, a run on Twitter or X or whatever. He has a verified account. Also, I'm going to say this too. I'm probably only say this once. Um, guys, someone at our parent company verified our Twitter account. And I'm really annoyed because a lot of people hit, hit, hit me up to be like, oh, you, you always talk about this is dumb. Um, oh, yeah. The clapter point, uh, Eddie, spot on. Um, uh JJ Carter, I think dad eight is the one I was thinking of right there. Uh, for those who don't know, it's canon that I have 14 dad, um, 14 dads, but 
Um, someone in our parent company verified our Twitter account on Wisecrack, and now we look like a bunch of fucking chodes. Um, I promise you, I'm never going to do some like long, uh, you know, essay on Twitter. I think that's really stupid, but I don't know. It's annoying. It just annoyed me that they did that and didn't tell me. But I think what's happening is that they're just trying to make money however they can right now, and in a desperate attempt to do that, they've you know done this whatever. Okay, so here's here's what what. Hank Green says, he says, I think a harm of online activism is the this is actually easy argument. Now, I'm someone that builds straw men as a bit of a hobby. So, you know, game recognized game here. I don't know. Whenever people use terms like online activism, it's like, what do you mean? If online activism means people saying stuff on social media, I don't know. Like, are we are we are we calling that activism? Are we just saying that like people say stuff on the internet, you know, yeah. Pe- people say stuff on, on the internet. So there you go. Um, hey, please like the stream. If you haven't already, it helps us out. It means a lot. <clears throat> um, I'll say this too. I'm going to say another thing I shouldn't say. We've been a little bit al- algorithmically boned because um, I don't know if you guys have noticed this. We did these Monday streams for this Butterfinger thing. And if you look at the numbers on the streams, you're like, what? 90,000 people watch these? No, they didn't. They, we had to, the company, they paid money to inflate those numbers so that the sponsor wasn't mad. But what YouTube does, and I don't even begrudge YouTube for that, when they see you fucking cooking the books, they're like, uh uh uh, and they punish you a little bit. But we don't, we don't do that on Wisecrack Live. Why, or Wisecrack Live, we're organic, we're legit, we do it right. So we got to kind of build up some steam again. So please like the stream, share it with friends. Uh, we're having a great time today. Hour two, you do, yeah, Travis is going to be here. It's going to be a great time. So, um, I, so I don't know. I think right off the bat to me, it just seems like if Hank Green wants to say some shit, just say it. We don't always have to frame everything around. Like I am responding to online activism and people who say this, you're just making a thing up. Just say what you want to say. Uh, I said, I've seen lots of folks indicate that a single billionaire could solve homelessness or that there are 30 times more houses than homeless people. So we could just give them all houses. He says, these words are fantastic for activating people, but they're also lies. I don't know, a couple of things here. And, and I'm going to you know tag, tag Henry in at various times throughout this. And I'm curious what you think in the chat here as well. Um, I appreciate that you guys like that I tell the truth. This is also why I'm going to get fired. So, you know, one day you'll have to come watch a, a low rent stream on, on my own channel. We'll see if I can scrap together enough money to pay Henry to, to, to make it with me. Yeah. We can um, go play outer wilds on Twitch. Yeah. Um, it says I've seen it. So I don't know. I, when it says these words are fantastic for activating people, maybe like if, if hearing, if hearing a fact like, you know, so-and-so's wealth could pay for X, if that helps people realize the absurdity and the contradictions inherent in our system, then I think that is good. And I do think maybe, and we'll get into this more, what um, Mr. Green might be missing here a little bit. And correct me if I'm wrong, folks in the chat and Henry, but I feel like when someone makes the point that a single billionaire could solve X, what they're not saying is Bill Gates should solve homelessness. Yeah. What they're saying is, we, yeah, I'll say this one thing. I want to hear what you think. But in my mind, what that person is saying is, Isn't it fucking insane that we live in a system that allows this to happen? We live in an economic and political system that will allow one person to possess so much wealth that it could change the lives of a bunch of other people. And we think this is normal. Um, Go ahead, Henry. Yeah, they're not saying literally uh, that's the mechanism to employ. They're drawing a, a a comparison of just disparity and how kind of gross it is that this exists within like the the social system we we permit to exist. Yeah, and again, Alex Zoidberg says good people need check in too. You know, a hundred percent. And just I'll, I'll say it a few times, just to be clear. Jerry said, "Don't you dare speak a negative word about Hank Green, bro. Don't you do it." Not not being too negative, guys. Not being too negative. Okay. Also, again. Go ahead. Also, just to, you know, kick off 
by uh, sp- specifying online activism and not activism as a whole, you're removing the whole material side of activism as an activity to where, like, if you're only online, all you have is, like, metaphor and speech and, like, what yeah. you can suggest and tell people since you're not organizing in a material sense and doing, like, a, a pragmatic on-the-ground goal. Yeah. Um, hey, I just want to shout out to the Bides real quick. 19 month member of, of Wisecrack and Wisecrack Live. Um, so just shout out to Dude Bides. Dude Bides is probably the first like fan of the channel or member of this community that I ever like knew, connected with. Whatever. So it just it's great to have him around still. It means a lot. Uh so thank you so much, uh, dude. Uh but yeah. Um yeah, Disky says I love Hank Green and I adore the man. So nice people you love to me. For sure. And again. That's this is coming from a place of like, like this guy, like his work, OG in the field. And uh, extraneous, but I think he's missing the mark here. Yeah, it's <clears> extraneous <throat> not to discount uh, any active real life activism going on. I'm talking more about the rhetoric of this post by starting off with online activism. So yeah. the post itself is putting itself within the realm of only online activism. We don't talk about the material. Yeah, and, and this is like a different conversation for another day, maybe, but. You know, I do think the best we can hope for for whatever we call online activism is sort of like, I guess, like ideological awareness, consciousness shaping and activation. Yeah. It's, like, I think that what it can do at, at its best is like make us think, oh, that's weird. Oh, that's bad. Oh, shit. Things are more fucked up than I realize, which is valuable. That's I mean, it's not like really a material practice. Yeah, it gives you more of an awareness that you can then take to whatever your uh, more local geographic situation is and figure out things there. Yeah, um, so we'll keep reading. So uh, Hank just called these lies. He said the U.S. government currently spends around $50 billion per year keeping people housed. Um, I would be very curious to see how that money is spent. States, of course, have their own budgets. If Bill Gates spent the same amount of money the U.S. does just to keep people housed, he would be out of money in three years. Okay. I mean, that, that's one of those ones where I'm like, I totally get the point he's making that like Bill Gates spending that money now isn't a long-term solution, but I'd let Bill, Bill Gates go broke so people could have housing for three years. I think that would be a great use of his money, but it would not be a permanent solution. Of course, and he's not going to like, I, I think the point as well that most people would make, again, no one is saying Bill Gates should literally sign that check. I think what they're probably saying, or what they're probably getting at is, if we taxed Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and all these other jabronis at a, at a rate that, that's pretty, pretty fair to their income, then that money could be used to do a lot more. Um, he goes on to say the statistics about there being more houses than homeless are just fake. I mean, the statistics I've seen on that, I've never really looked at national stuff. I've looked at... Um, stuff in certain cities but i do know that like in cities especially los angeles and new york and chicago there's tons of empty properties um, especially in luxury apartment buildings because you know we we all know this a lot of real estate value is speculative so what's valuable about real estate isn't always the money you get from the person being in the building what's valuable about real estate is that you are betting on the land upon which your property sits is going to appreciate in value so that you will then have that money. Um, the, the, in the, then the show, The Curse, kind of has a thing uh, about this in it. If anyone's watched The Curse, uh, this isn't a spoiler, but in like the second or third episode, they kind of talk about how, you know, they they more or less let a family that would probably otherwise be unhoused live in a house for free because they're like, well, who gives a fuck? Like this, we just want this prop, we want this land to rise in value. That's all we care about. So I, I think that they're. Even if the numbers don't add up to where there's like a unused one bedroom apartment for everyone house person, I think again, when people say that, it is not saying the solution to the problem is to literally force, you know, unhoused people Tear open into the doors. every Yeah. I think the point is to say again, is it weird? Is it bad that we live in a system where it is financially beneficial to own unoccupied property and that you can benefit financially and even from our tax system 
by owning that property. So we live in a system that makes it incredibly hard for people without access to, to wealth in many cases to own a home. I think that I saw something recently about how there's like two places in America where you can afford a one bedroom apartment on minimum wage or something like that. Um, but, you know, we accept that while also accepting that it's normal and good for there to be unoccupied housing as a speculative commodity rather than housing as a right. And to be clear, once again, Hank later in this thread says some good things. And it's very clear that his motive in this discussion, what's up, Mr. Navidad, that his motive in this discussion is that he wants people to be in houses. This is not, and I mean this again, like, um, Many people would make arguments like this from the perspective, what's up, Maeve Callahan, uh, would make these arguments from the perspective of the real estate industry, from the perspective of the finance industry, sticking up for those folks. Um, hey, we might get a 666 today. So keep liking the stream. Thanks for being here. Love and appreciate you guys. Um, just a reminder, in hour two, Eudelia Travis is coming on. Um, very funny, smart comedian. Um, so he goes on and says, um, so these stats rely on looking at extremely low estimates of homelessness, which are never used in any other context and include normal vacancy rates. An apartment is counted as vacant, even if it's only vacant for a month while the landlord is finding a new tenant. Totally fair. It's totally fair that if someone takes vacancy rates in that sense and uses that as a way to say, see, there's housing for everyone, they are missing the point. It says in a country with... Um, I'm so bad at numbers. Is that a hundred? Is that a hundred and fifty million housing units? Okay, hundred and guys. I stopped taking math junior year of high school. Um, in a country with one hundred and fifty million housing units, a two percent vacancy rate is three million units, which yes is greater than the homeless population, but a two percent vacancy rate is extremely low and bad because it means there's fewer available units that there are people looking to move into, which drives the price of rent higher. Again, like fair, but this is one of those things where it's like like a certain type of how do I want to phrase this? It's almost like logic derived logic in concert with digital research getting in the way of seeing the bigger picture it is a little bit of what I see going on here. Because again, there is a normal vacancy rate, but we also know that think about how many people own multiple homes. Think about how many people in this country, especially super rich people, own vacation houses that are barely occupied. And of course, again, there's 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 a lot of empty units everywhere. Uh, Dead Card 13 says, I'm just irritated that the perception is people have to go without because of scarcity. Um, yeah, we got to maintain that uh, vacancy rate to uh, keep the rents at the right rate so that the market functions properly. Yeah. Luke um, Macri says, I would say there are plenty of idealists who want to do away with billionaires on a moral basis. However, if you ask what they thought, was practical, they would say, taxes. Um, well, let's see, every stream I've joined, you've been nothing but, a, oh, I, Drew Crock, I, I appreciate that. I was going to keep reading it, but then it was nice about me. Um, so I don't want to, yeah. Uh, Dermot F Fenster says, cost of living is quintupled, wages only up 8%, and for the lowest 25% of earners, wages only went up 3% in that time. Uh, Julia's watching to get caught up to us. Um, let's see. Um, Pontus Whalen says, I'm wondering if this tweet is also Hank telling us why about Gaza. Um, Niney says, what are you even talking about now? Um, what, what I'm talking about now is, uh, Hank Green, very legendary, famous, great YouTuber made some comments about, um, housing that I think missed the mark. Uh, Candified said BlackRock, Blackstone, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, here's another thing and, oh, what's up, Lexa? Great to see you. Another thing that we need to think about with all of this. And right now, finance companies like BlackRock and Blackstone are acquiring residential housing. That should kind of tell us something yep. like that, that Wall Street firms are acquiring in large swaths residential housing. You know? I don't know. <clears throat> but let's see. Um, so it goes on. And this is like, here's the thing that is, this is good. So let's just be clear again. If anyone's just tuning in, and they're like, oh, is Michael doing some clickbait bullshit where he tries to take down someone everyone likes? Not doing that at all. Hank Green seems great. I'm glad that he's healthy and doing well. Would love to go to Montana and buy that guy a beer. Well, the state of Montana, they make good beer there. It says housing should not be an option in this country. Yes. 
Totally. He's absolutely right. Housing should not be an option. Everyone should get to live in a house. If you think that's crazy, then I don't know. Again, we don't do politics here, but we have empathy for everyone and think everyone should have a good life. Part of having a good life should be that you have a place to lay your head at night. It should be something we spend tons of money on. Totally. We should spend tons of money on housing. It should be a priority for every leader and every citizen. Agreed. It should also be interfaced with in real complex ways. Now, here's where I start to lose, where he loses me a little bit, right? Is it wrong to say that the idea of providing housing on a large scale, is it wrong to say that's complex? Absolutely not. But here's what I worry about. Um, a thing that we do a lot, thanks for being here, thanks for liking the stream, keep doing it. We love to say that things are complex Nuance. when we don't want to do them. And here's something I was reflecting about on the other day. During the COVID-19, you know, the early days of the pandemic, um, 90s, I have no idea why I wrote this. Um, early in the days of the COVID-19 pandemic in America, the government sent everyone money. It was, it was pretty quick, too. They did it pretty quickly. Um, and everything was fine. There was large-scale subsidizing of healthcare cost. And everything was fine. Um, in many cities, unused hotels were used to uh, give places for unhoused people to live, and everything was fine. Um, you know, people, uh, th th we, we did rent freezes. So, so people wouldn't get overcharged. We let people not pay rent for a bit every, and everything was fine. Right. Um, and Porkins is here eating that slop in their little box. We love it. So, you know, again, I'm not, I agree in general with what Hank is saying here, but it's interesting how sometimes we like to make certain things complex and use that as a reason to not solve those problems, where some of the stuff I think is maybe less complex than we make it, uh, to, to be honest. You know, it's not, for example, it wouldn't be that complex to create major restrictions around the real estate lobbying industry. It would not be that complex to change the taxing system around real estate and property values. It wouldn't be that complex to, you know, provide housing vouchers to people, giving them money based on where they live in their income. A lot of these things would be pretty doable. Um, so he goes on to say, and it should be remembered that the main way we solve the problem is building more housing. Yeah. Which I find a whole lot of my peers and seemingly progressive spaces are actually opposed to. Henry, I'm curious if you have thoughts on this. Are a lot of people in progressive spaces opposed to building housing? Well, it's a matter of what type of housing is being built. Because if we just keep churning out the same kind of poorly made suburbanite, made to be flip kind of things, it's not that great. Also, like as far as priorities go, there's also rent control uh, and kind of zoning laws for you know multi multi unit uh, apartments, tenements, things uh, for lower income people, uh, so that people aren't just like taking government subsidies and building uh, McMansions out in the middle of nowhere just to cash in. Um, so yeah. there is a lot of, there is, this is kind of where I start to diverge is the building more housing priority because there are other, other means of facilitating, uh, as I said earlier, just the, the many ways that this can go wrong, if not regulated or mitigated through other types of, uh, laws and, uh, yeah. And I, um, it's... and I just only interrupting to say we're, we're getting close to the six, six, six zone. So Keep liking the stream. If you haven't liked the stream yet, please do that. Um, right now, I do know for sure in the office I'm in is one of the highest ranking uh, corporate members of the, the company that owns us is the only other person I currently see in this office. So they, in sitting in their little room, might have to hear me scream 666 and Satan stuff if you get us there. So I'm going to go back to the threat. So I'm not going to be looking at the numbers for a second. But if we get there, let me know. But now they're dipping as soon as I said that. Um, but no, but I get what you're saying, Henry. And I do think, yeah, I, I mean... I think that when we talk about building housing, you're right. It can't be more single family suburban homes. We need to think about building. Yeah, there's NIMBYism. efficient urban housing. And even for the environment, like that's what right. we got to do. I'm that's sure Julia Coves has thoughts the, uh, on this. Environmental impact aspects as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Look at everything. Julia Sanchaga. Julia actually works in this field, so she knows what she's doing. Um, okay. But yeah, so. But yeah, again, I think that maybe like saying a bunch of your peers in progressive spaces are opposed to, I don't know, 
Maybe there's ways to think about that more subtly. Sometimes they are opposed to it because they've heard stats that the problem is simple and can be solved very easily. If only we just decided to solve it, which is doing real damage. Okay, this is what I don't think is true. I don't think this is true. I don't think it's true that people are hearing stats and seeing stuff online that make them think it's <clears throat> easy to solve this. And I don't think that's doing real damage. I can't see what damage. I mean, I don't know, Henry, let me know. Are you, what damage is it doing? I don't know what easy fixes have been pitched besides build more housing. That's that's honestly the simple direct kind of like, don't think about it, build more housing seems to be the only version of this I hear in that form. Because most of the time it's like, oh, well, there's zoning issues. There's nimbyism. There's, you know, are people going to build low income? Can they get that occupied? Can the people in like yeah. that area, like, is it a food desert? Do they have jobs? Like, yeah, the simple thing is what he's saying. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think too, I'm going to, a little bit of a philosophical that friend, not allowed to do question. Just tell me that. But philosopher I like a lot. Um, <laughs> SJ Riker brought up guillotines. Um, um, Leopold Shark said, Mr. Beast can cure, cure blindness for a thousand. Yeah, Mr. Mister Beast, build affordable housing challenge. Um, but a philosopher I like a lot, a guy named Peter Hallward. Uh, last time I checked, I was teaching somewhere in London, like Kingston College or something like that, but was working on this project for a while uh, called like the Will of the People. And if you Google Peter Hallward, Will of the People, you'll find some of these papers. But this whole project was looking at the way we think about political will. When we say political will, we basically mean this idea. What's up, Brian Burns, BW? Um, if you share my last name, I'm going to shout you out. Um, what we see in history philosophy is people talking about will as this idea uh, that we can think about stuff and do stuff, that we have the will to make things happen. A classic example of this, of course, would be the French Revolution. What's up, dude? Abides, um, which is why I. Uh, Wes Walcott said, Mr. Beast did build houses for his employees. Honestly, I'll say this in fairness. I, I think I told you guys this. I kind of like interviewed for a job with Mr. Beast once. And one of their things was if you move to work with them, they pay for your housing for the first like three to six months, which is like a very cool thing. You also have to move in the middle of fucking nowhere. But still, it's a nice thing. But we think about the political will, you know, think about the French Revolution, this idea that the will of the people collectively organized was able to fundamentally restructure how a monarchical society worked. We think about, you know, the Haitian revolution where Haitian slaves, um, you know, freed themselves, an act of self-liberation. The will of those people changed the whole situation. Uh, it then got screwed because the French then charged them for years and years and years. And lots of the problems in Haiti go back to the way in which European colonizers wanted money back for their lost property of those property being 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 people and porkins uh wisecrack is not built housing for me um but um north carolina is not the middle of nowhere they're the place they're at in north carolina is middle of nowhere i love north carolina it's plenty of areas in north carolina i love and also it's cool to live in rural areas small towns can be great i'm just not at a point in my life right now where i want to do that yeah penny waldrop says haitians freed themselves and they had the own money the france to pay for it but the point i'm making is this philosopher peter hallward you know, I saw him give a talk once where he said something to the effect of like, and this is shows how old I am. It was maybe during like the second Iraq war or something, but he was like, we could end that war right now if we wanted to. And he said that. And I was like, that's stupid. And I thought about it and I was like, no, he's, he's not wrong. Cause if you think about it, if like, if the will of the people is unified and collected, who can stop millions and millions and billions of people from changing the world if they want to? I know that sounds a little abstract, a little pie in the sky, but it is true. Um, so he goes on and says, by telling the simplest version of the story, we get people riled up. But what do you do with that once you're riled up, if they're riled up by lies? There are only two paths. One, tell them the truth, that everything they've been told is actually a lie and that the problem is actually hard. But again, I don't think it's it's not a lie to say the wealth of Bill Gates could house X amount of people. That's not a lie, but it's also not a policy proposition, right? It's a presentation of an economic fact to point out the contradictions in a system that creates or makes possible that very set of contradictions. Because I think if we look at it, the fact that one person gets this much money, while all these people don't get a place to live in, if we have a baseline of human empathy, I don't care what your politics are, that seems weird. 
seems to be a contradiction when we think about um, living in the, you know, the richest country in the history of humanity. So I don't know if it's a lie to say that. It goes on to say, and because the problem is both big and hard, nice, tons of people are working very hard on it and they should be grateful for, or even become one of those people. I'm, I'm a little lost here. Um, yeah, it's kind of like a... Who should I be grateful for? Yeah. I don't, I don't know if I'm grateful. Um, so yeah, Julia Julia's working hard on it. Okay, so I'm grateful for Julia. And you might be saying to me right now, like, yeah, but Julia's in Canada, Michael. I don't, I don't care about national borders. What, what's a country? Who cares? Who cares about countries? Um, so because of that, I support what Julia is doing. I support Canada. Um, I don't blame Canada for anything. Dr. Clownicus says, Burns, you're describing how unions make things better too. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Clownicus. In, 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 of course, describing collective will, that's like what a union does. And there's that thing too, this might sound pie in the sky, but you don't know. If enough people were just like, we're not paying taxes. We're not paying our student loans. We're not paying rent. We're not voting, whatever. Stuff could happen. Wasn't that part of the same so act? Uh, wasn't there some sort of uh, follow through on the save act because like there was a sixty percent people not paying when they first tried to reenact stuff? I'll have to look it up. I mean, yeah, no, yeah, it was something like that for sure. And that's why there's like the student debt strike and people trying to organize around. Um, and really, I mean, all we're missing, we have the will. We just don't have like, I think like the courage. I don't have the courage. I need more courage. Um, not to go all uh. Wizard of Oz on you. But okay, so there's the one option. We tell the truth. We yada, yada, yada. Um, but I do think like the people working hard on the problem of housing in earnest are very minimal. What we mostly have, and I'll just speak to the state of, I live in the state of California. The state of California, its biggest uh, lobbying groups are is the real estate lobby. Um, real estate lobbyists have a stranglehold on the state. And everyone who says it's woke, it's progressive, it's socialist, it's communist, it's fucking not. You have Hollywood studios in this in this state who will kick you off of movies for saying that genocide is bad. That's not very woke or progressive. You have, you know, liberal Democratic candidates who are completely funded by the real estate lobby. People who only care about the speculative value of housing now putting people in those houses. I don't think that's very progressive or whatever, you know. Um, so I think there are people like the Julias of this world working on this problem hard. But I imagine Julia's work is hard and it's uphill and, and, you know, I imagine if you were doing the work Julia does in a place like California, it's going to be super hard because you're fighting against private industry. Um, it goes on and say, two, keep lying until they're convinced that the problem does not exist because it is hard. It exists because people are evil. Okay, this one's weird. Keep lying until they're convinced that the problem does not exist because it is hard. It exists because people are evil. So I guess the gist here would be that when we, the lie is to say, right? A few rich dudes could pay for all the housing. That's the lie. And if we say it enough, we're convincing people that the reason for there not being enough housing is not that it's a, just a hard problem to solve. It exists because people are evil. Well, let's get back to Will. I do not believe, and I'm curious what you think in the chat. I'm curious what Henry thinks. I do not believe that a majority of people that have power financially and politically in this country want to solve that problem. I don't believe that. Um, I don't. I, in my heart of hearts, I don't believe this problem exists because it's hard to solve. I think it exists because they don't want to solve it. Yeah, I think it exists because <laughs> the current system is uh, making somebody very rich and they'll do anything to maintain that status. Yeah. I mean, there's an entire finance industry that revolves around this, not to be a, you know, a Hollywood lib or anything, but for the love of God, watch the big short, um, if, if for nothing else than to see a, a really good early Jeremy Strong performance. but. You know, it doesn't, it's not profitable in a speculative finance sense to solve these problems. But like, think about it. Like, I don't remember in my lifetime hearing many, and I'll just speak to, you know, Democratic candidates talking about housing. You might hear people talk about tax credits or like home loan reduction programs. But we say this is a hard problem. I don't know. Countries in this world where they just have a lot of social housing. Um, it makes me question, I just, uh, I know it will be anecdotal evidence, but like just the evidence that leads them to those points one and two, like who is it that he feels is not being appreciated and is being scapegoated as evil? And uh, 
who and in what style of evil uh, are they being called? Because, I mean, I don't see a lot of, uh, I don't know, a lot of, like, from-the-left criticism of center-left liberal stuff like housing. It never strikes me as, like, reactionary or essentialist with its morality. It's usually rooted in systemic and economic complaint. Yeah. And and I do think, like, and this is something we should all remember, right? Friends, people in the chat, community members. Um, we keep just getting so close to 666 and it doesn't happen. My, my satanic soul is losing it. Um, so, okay, push it guys. Let's do it. Let's friggin' do it. Like the, like the stream if you haven't already. Thanks for doing that. Um, but again, it's and, and Hank is right here. It's easy to say that people are evil. Yeah. DZ in the chat said calling it evil makes it really, it's not many people who work in, let's say the real estate industry are not evil people. They're people that live in a world, the structures of which directly reward that sort of behavior. Okay. We're not, we're not going to do the game where like capitalism is capitalism because people are evil or bad. No, there's, we got to think in terms of systems and structures guys. Uh, and I don't think anyone, I don't know anyone at least who's like, Oh, dead card gifted five memberships. Thank you so much. Lord of the chat. Let's go. Thanks for doing it. JJ, Hassan, Mark, Akram, Wetz, they're in. Um, but, you know, I don't think anyone I know is going to say that, like, oh, it's because, because people are evil, we have these problems. No, because we have a system that is predicated on the situation. That's, that's, I mean, that's, it's a structural problem. And the, and the issue then with some of the solutions that Hank, I think very earnestly and with very good intention is talking about, it, it, it's sort of, how do we solve things from within the situation? How do we, you know push policy within a situation, but we're talking about pushing policy in a situation that's fundamentally predicated on the opposite of what we want. You know, um, he says, or I guess three people could just be angry and sad all the time, which is not great for affecting real change. Uh, anger can do some stuff. He goes on and says, I don't know. I'm aware that people aren't doing this because they want to create a problem. And often they believe the fake stats they're quoting, but I do not think, but I do th not think it is doing more good than harm. And I would like to see folks doing less of it. One thing that definitely does more good than harm is actually connecting to the complexity of an issue that is important to you. Do that and see there are many people working hard. Again, and this is the problem, right? Um, Hank Green is making a very good point that we cannot focus on, let's say, the initial emotive response we have to a thing. We have to think structurally about the complex systems in play, but he's doing that. He's saying that without doing it, right? Because the question is, what what is the complexity or what is the what are the systematic issues that leave us in a situation where we're in a political and economic system that values unoccupied speculative real estate acquisition more than it does people living in houses? That's crazy. You know, abstract from the system we live in, that's pretty nuts. And and I do think that's what we should be thinking about. He ends by saying we do not have any big easy problems. If we did, they'd be solved. I'm sorry it's a bummer, but here we are. I don't know. I think there's some problems that you could probably solve by just taxing people. Yeah, that last bit, it just sounds like such a, a rationalization of like settle for less that I just, it doesn't sit well with me. Yeah. Um, I, oh, we, we were in past 666. Six, I'm seeing 675. Yeah, we blasted past 666. Six, six. Six, six. Let's go, guys. Six, six, six. We're doing it. We're bringing evil back. We're bringing evil, evil, evil to YouTube. We're a positive evil. We're not evil in the way that he talks about. You know, My we're bringing some darkness. We're bringing some evil. We're bringing some witchy energy. We're bringing some satanic energy. We're really going for it. So great job. We did it. We did it. We did it together. What good timing to do it at as well, everyone. Um, sorry for the five of you that hate when we do this. Sorry for those of you who do. If you if you are a member, you have some emotes you can use for this. We really appreciate it. Um, uh, Julia Cove says you can solve problems by taxing people, but the people who have the political influence will not support that. And therefore the politicians will not support it. Yeah, that's the issue. That's the issue. Um, thanks for being here, friends. Really appreciate you. Really. Appreciate What's the link you just shared? Oh, just am I evil by diamond head? Oh, hell yeah. Um, I was just, I was just curious. Um, so I don't know my like, and, and, and of course, he he goes on and he says some like more stuff in a in, in a follow up, um, which we maybe won't get too into. There's some good and and to be clear, there's like some good responses to this where people do kind of like <coughs> kindly call him out and you know listen, Hank Green, 
is not going to watch this. But if for any reason someone who's close to him or someone who's going to who has a little snitch energy in them does watch this, note that like good person makes 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 good good content. Um, and he's and yeah, Penny Waldrip says something too. If the point of this is like stop complaining online and do some stuff, totally no disagreement with that at all. Um, if you know he says that we do need housing, that people deserve housing. He's totally right. He's totally right. All we're saying is that he's maybe missing out on A, what people are saying when they're making some of these critiques, and B, you know, um, B, what the real complexity is here. And I know it gets annoying to talk about, guys. We, we have to talk about capitalism if we're going to talk about why there's not enough housing for people. You just, you just can't avoid it. And, and if you try to talk about why there's not enough housing for people in this country without thinking critically and seriously about an economic system that creates those conditions, you're just kind of swimming in circles. Uh, but, you know, shout out to Hank Green. And again, this is an, this is an instance of just pointing out problems with someone who has, has good intention, but maybe it's the point. I think Udoye is here now. Um, we, we can get set up there. Uh, while we get that set up, everyone, thanks again for being here. Uh, this is Wisecrack Live. It's Michael Burns joined by producer Henry. Um, it, yeah. Um, let's see. We're going to go for roll for a second. We'll be right back with you, Doye. No, you do you, you do. I'm gonna try. Um hey guys, we're we're back with Joey Travis from you're you're still in New York City, right? I am still in New York, yes. I feel like I'm allowed to oh yeah, when you wear a shirt that says that on it, I feel like it's I'm allowed to, you know, know. I mean that. that's I went to a LCD concert one time, so you know Hell yeah. Was it one of the ones that was sponsored by American Express? And you had yes, to have it, the Yes, it was. <laughs> Yes, it was. <laughs> listen, I was, listen, if that's going to be a way that people get to see live music, sure. Why not? You know, let's use the credit card companies for something. Um, yeah. Th- yeah. Why not? You know, I, uh, I, 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 the thing that's connecting my audio. Yeah. No worries. I had, I had enough fun. I, it's not gonna, it's not gonna do anything else in my life, at least in the short term. So I'm just trying oh, yeah. not to think about it. <laughs> um, for anyone who's, who's tuning in, uh, who doesn't know you uh, you're a comedian, writer, performer, does a lot of cool stuff. Um, I'm, I think a lot of people have, at least in this world of the YouTube people have watched uh jaded forum before. Um, wait, are you, are you all making new episodes? Um, give me one if second. I've lost yeah. audio, but yes. yes. <laughs> okay. We'll, we'll give you a second. Um, and I'm just going to keep talking about why, um, 
you know he's a fun person to talk to. But yeah, if you all haven't seen Jaded Forum, it's a really cool series of videos. Um, smart, interesting, right. funny people talk for right. a while. So, um, cool. You there now? Is it going to fuck you up if I just go off laptop audio? Because this is no. getting crazy. I, okay. we, well, you hear you fine now. Okay, great. Yeah, uh, awesome. Yes, yes, we are doing more uh, Jaded Forum. It's we're just waiting to get everything sorted out. It's been kind of uh, it's been a few months of just like figuring things out and making sure everything, you know, it's a cooperative uh, organization. And so things kind of uh, things have to be cooperative. And so we just put a lot of we just took some time off to make sure everything is that. Uh, yeah. You know, to put it's great. Yeah. No, but you know, I'm I'm I was really excited when I saw you all post that something was coming back soon because I have very, very much enjoyed watching those. Uh and such a you guys had such a weird mix of times where it's genuinely like real, real funny, but then real, real both like deep but but emotional. And I mean that in a positive way. Cause I think sometimes when people talk about like the political and economic situations that make us all stressed out. It's easy to think of that wholly in the realm of ideas and not in the way that it like affects people. I think especially you all being creative people, like yeah. letting yourself express how that feels, I think is really important. It sometimes gets left out of those discussions. Yeah. And you know, I think the time away from the show is kind of given me an even deeper understanding of it in the sense of like, um, I think especially in a world like, I mean, you mentioned that it's, it, you know, it, it balances being funny and and serious, for lack of a better word. But yeah, like, yeah, stand up comedy, which is my main thing, it doesn't mm -hmm. do a good job of doing that. I think like over uh, over the past twelve years that I've been doing it, you, it's kind of oscillated between this like staring off into the middle distance version of it that like uh that Chappelle has started doing or Aziz did after his little in his little apology special mm -hmm. or like you know there's the one man show uh mm -hmm. paradigm that pe you get you get slapped on you if you seem like you're trying to be a good person which is yeah, yeah. very frustrating me but like it doesn't really do a good job of like of like living in in between those feelings and generally being honest about what's going on in the world outside of your own personal individual shit, you know? Cause like even on, even on jaded, it felt like, um, or has felt like when we get honest about things, it's kind of on a personal individual mm -hmm. level still. And I think when you're trying to elicit laughter, people have a lot of trouble just being, really genuinely honest about what's going on in the world, you know? And I think there's an element of even suppression of your feelings about like, for example, Palestine. If you mm -hmm. like, I tend to think of myself as being very open on stage, and like to a degree that I don't think I am like personally mm -hmm. with people sometimes. And even I've found it hard to just like bring up something that we all know is going on mm -hmm. and yeah. and make it through that without groans or people being like, oh, why'd you do this? I'm like, it's on the fucking news, man. Yeah. You know? Yeah. How are you how how is it how is it bringing you down because I brought it up in this context? Like we all know that it's going on. You know? Yeah. No, there's a like a, it's like two months ago or earlier on in you know the start of the genocide we're living through um, was doing a show and it was like in my head that all this was happening and was very you know that kind of self critical moment of like what does it mean to try to like perform and make stuff when shit like that's happening in the world how does one address that and there was this comedian I feel so bad I forget her last name right now Maggie something will hit me later like two lines in just like bluntly acknowledged it. And, you know, at the time it felt like, I don't want to say like brave in some crazy way. Cause like saying a thing that is real is not necessarily an act of bravery, but it felt like it opened up the room in a really good way. And I was almost even 
embarrassed that I was so surprised that someone was able just to be like, Hey, this is what's fucking happening. This is, this is what's, what, what's, yeah. what's shaping the mood of the world right now. And to, and I, I don't know, I, I, I'm sure you have thoughts on this, but like, you know, we worked on a video a month or two ago about like comedy and politics. And the thing I'm always thinking about is that tension between not just comedy, but art in general and how I truly believe it helps us think about the world, understand the world. It can affect change. It can shift consciousness, but also that like, it is supposed to be entertaining. We are supposed to have a nice time with it. And that sometimes when art gets too didactic, it can mm-hmm. stop feeling like art when it tells us what to do. And I don't, I don't know where I fall in that, but I'm wondering if you have thoughts on kind of that tension or how you've been navigating that and the stuff you're doing. I mean, I, I feel like what I'm seeing now is that we don't do a very good job of curating our audience um, mm-hmm. in the sense of like everything is kind of driven by just pure engagement. It doesn't matter what anybody's opinion is. It doesn't matter what they and you even hear people say this explicitly. It doesn't matter what what they think as long as they're talking about it. You know, like, yeah, they I see this in the context of like rappers a lot, like people like Kanye, Drake, whatever, mm-hmm. where Kanye will say some anti-Semitic shit. And then people always have this excuse is like, well, you're talking about him I'm like that's yeah, yeah, not yeah, yeah. Enough to really I don't think that's enough to to ride off of it in terms of like artistic expression. And I think like mm-hmm. in terms of our physical spaces, especially it's like. There is not a there is not a comedy club in the country where I can go and know that everybody is going to be with me on these very basic points. And I think yeah. I think as a conservative person, I think that is why people are so is are so like up in arms about cancel culture is because they had that at some point. They had that reassurance that they can go into a room and say some shit about uh, about black people or do an Indian accent or whatever, and people would be on their side. And mm-hmm. that's not to say that we have to exist in these bubbles uh, where everybody agrees with us. But like, I think when we talk about, you know, like the Roganite, like you got to debate people that disagree with you. It's like we got to be de- we got to be debating about like. Things that are worth debating about, not over whether or not Palestinian people are human. You know, it's like people, we're not. And I'm kind of veering off the art subject, but I think that's important uh-huh. when it comes to like being able to say certain shit and getting to the heart of what is actually important in the art. You know what I mean? And like, I think that I think a lot of people tend to think like I hate the the term leftist because people don't know what the fuck it means anymore but um yeah it doesn't mean anything these days (laughs) yeah but like i think people tend to find leftist or liberal comedians boring because they're having to explain their whole worldview on stage just to get Mm -hmm. you on board with the the the, what might be a genius punchline it often is not but (laughs) you know but they're having to do all this legwork just to put you into the context of what they believe in. And we just don't have those reliable spaces where we have it. And it's not even like being in a bubble. It's having the same collective issues. You know, we don't have the same problems, but just door to door even. Yeah. Well, it's always, I think too, with like performative spaces as well, where, you know, I mean, sometimes it feels like when we, when we, let's say, like, curate our own spaces, you know, like, I, I know that you um, run some stuff. I saw you posting about a, a, a comedy and a music thing you're doing now, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, in curating stuff, it can feel like it creates a space for that. But something I, I worry about in events that I've helped curate is like, but then am I just like, is there space for anyone who might not already kind of think like everyone else who's coming in the space anyways? Mm -hmm. You know, like, and and it, and I do think there's value in like, if a couple of people who are in that room are maybe challenged and maybe exposed to some different ideas, that's good. But it kind of feels like, at least as I think about it in in Los Angeles, right? Like you have your smaller off kilter creative spaces to do comedy or music or whatever, where people might generally 
be in a similar aesthetic or, or political bubble. And then you go like three miles over to some of the stand up clubs where there's more tourists and stuff like that, where you're going to get, you know, Rogan, Roganites and uh, infinitely TikTok clippable comedic lines and stuff like that. But there's like nothing in the middle. And, you know, even talking to friends sometimes who will do a set in one of those smaller curated indie spaces and then be like, oh, I got to go to the store or whatever where I'm going to present things in a different way because I got to play to that crowd. Yeah. Um, uh, sometimes I, I just wonder, like, how do we how do we create something that's like more in the middle and how do we even get people to do stuff anymore? How do we create like physical spaces? Uh, solve it all, please. Oh, sick. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, we brought you here to solve it. That's that's what we pitched it. You're going <laughs> to explain everything and fix all the problems. Well, one, I do feel like there's a lot more variance even in people, even in like what you would call a bubble than you think. Like even, yeah, I think in uh, even with Jaded Forum, where I think we've been very clear about what positions we do and don't take. And yet we still have people DMing us like you should have Joe Rogan on or you should and not yeah. exactly that. But like. um, But just like suggesting things that we wouldn't we've said openly that we would never do or that mm -hmm. we have no interest in um so i think there's enough variance that you're still grabbing people that may not necessarily believe what you believe i think it's just a matter of um establishing what is and isn't acceptable in certain spaces and i think just like mainstream clubs don't really do that and if they do it's uh what is what is acceptable is like what is appealing to the corporate you know bodies mm -hmm. above them or whatever like the fact that uh that no shorts has been a rule in comedy for fucking 50 years and nobody really thinks about why that is <laughs> so so both comedy and professional golf are the two fields where you can't wear shorts i guess yeah and it's like we, we, can we just stop for a second and think about what what it means to have to bring these pr this professionalism into making people laugh? Why is that? Mm -hmm. you know, why is something like that so important to people? Who gives a shit? Um, yeah. And I think the uh, a bigger problem that I meant to mention earlier is that like oh yeah, bring it up people that you just touched on is that people are forced to capitulate to the more conservative um side of things when they when they go and perform at say the stand or i'll say stand up new york or west side comedy club both openly zionist comedy clubs at this point mm -hmm. um people are still capitulating to the whims of those places rather than the other way around where i think people think that they're having to capitulate to the left by not saying yeah. the n-word or whatever but they don't actually exist in the social context that uh that leftists would like them to exist in mm -hmm. which i think is like you know i mean for me would be to have these institutions be actually part of a community and be accountable to a community rather than just saying the right things yeah. Have you, have you seen any models of that? Are there places that you can think of that have gotten closer to something like that model? I mean, historically, there have been places that attempted that, um, which I don't remember the names of, but there was a, um, I think there was a circuit of venues that was like, um, that had like a liberation ideology behind them. Mm -hmm. But this was like damn near 100 years ago. But I think yeah. now, I mean, now, I mean, what I've recently done is gather a group of comedians into an email thread to just talk about things. And I think when yeah. I've articulated what I th think is important in these uh, spaces, like somebody emailed me back saying like, saying like, well, UCB tried what you're talking about and they failed. And I was like, well, I'm not talking about UCB. Yeah. UCB was UCB underpaid performers and, uh, and I think just basically everybody that was involved in that uh, in that operation. I did yeah. a couple 
lip shows there. I never took any of their classes, but all I've ever heard about in the improv space is exploitation. No, yeah, I mean, I can only speak to the the West Coast branch, but yeah, this is bad. Uh, they did. They, they, I don't really. There's people there. At least I know who like individuals tried to push them to do good things in earnest, but I don't think it was ever taken seriously enough to you know lead to any systemic change. And then it just got you know sold to another company. Um, yeah. But I mean, it's interesting. Like, I, I don't know as much about the history of stand up. I'm kind of a nerd about the history of like sketch and improv. And sometimes it stresses me out when you look back at the history of those things. And you have these really idealistic people that, you know, mm -hmm. wanted to make a sort of performance art that was like for everyone that was aimed at working people and members of a community that looked at the value of things like improv and sketch as being able to use current events and political happenings to talk about things that affected people's lives that were meant to have this. And, you know, you can read back on some of that stuff and it, it might feel a little idealist, but I still am like pulled towards that and pulled towards this idea that. I mean, not just comedy, but like art in general can have that effect. But it's so hard yeah. to think about how that happens now. And I know a few times when I've tried to put any effort into putting something together, oh, it's just like a lot of, lot of work, a lot of effort, especially in this climate where things are, are meant to be so connected to, to the ability to make some sort of content, the ability to commodify a piece of work into a clip and the ability to have something lead to something else. Um, yeah. or, or be like a jumping off point rather than the point being a community or community uh, where people get to work like in itself. Yeah, I think um, a big issue with the way art works now in terms of like um, discourse um, and attempting to provide solutions is that because there was an era where artistic expression was suppressed in the way that people think it is now. Uh, for the record, uh, Cliff Nestroff is a good resource on stand-up history. Um, mm -hmm. oh. And he just put out a new book on the Oh, culture. yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, on, the, on the culture war just throughout comedy yeah. and history. But um, I think, and this is true for art and for politics in general, is that people have this idea that because something was suppressed, that that means it was a solution. You know? I, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I have I, I have a joke that I was uh, doing for a second about how if they if they killed Malcolm X a few years earlier when he was when he still believed white people were made in a lab by <laughs> by a big headed scientist like we would have a we would live in a completely different world you know <laughs> like they like if they just they can just make these decisions to suppress certain things because I mean their attitude was completely different about I mean you know uh, what's in was um, Byung Chul Han says this, but like mm -hmm. their attitude was completely different. They would they would actively suppress things and realize that's yeah. not economical um, and it's not effective, you know. Mm -hmm. And now people think that, well, because they said you couldn't talk about white people on stage. Now that talking t now talking about white people on stage is going to solve racism. I used mm -hmm. to I used to feel that way or I didn't not like explicitly, but that's what. Yeah. You know. Uh, or people think because they try to suppress every attempt at uh, at socialism or communism that every attempt at socialism or communism is yeah, uh, yeah. good when there that is absolutely not the case. You know, I think people just don't have the the, the degree of critical thinking that would come with actively exploring ideas beyond just like what the government said you can't do. Yeah. And, and there is that sense. I mean, I think you see it politically, you see it socially, you see it creatively. That's constantly. And I know I, I fall into this trap a lot of like fetishizing that which came before fetishizing the, the failed attempts of others and thinking about how one can like repeat those in a contemporary context rather. And it sounds like you're doing this a little bit with some of the discussions you're having now, rather than thinking about like, you know, a little more blank slate, like, what do we want a thing to look like or what would it look like in this context to make something that seemed to at least like fit with those, with the values that we have or, or that we share collectively? Yeah, it's, I think, um, I mean, it's, it's both in creativity and in, actually, I can't even differentiate these things, but politically and artistically, mm -hmm. it all comes down to creativity. You know, mm -hmm. I think people are just, 
so dogmatic about what will and won't work because they are stuck in the in these ideas of the past or like whether it's you know fetishizing george carlin or lenny bruce or Mm -hmm. prior all of whom had their problems or if it's fetishizing stalin or uh for the black people thomas sankara who like all of these people were limited in their practice by the impositions that were put over them you know mm-hmm. patrice Lumumba never got to do anything because people thought he was a socialist you know um when he never actually said that he just didn't want to be involved in the in the global monetary system you know it's um i don't know i think people just have to be able to think critically about what's possible in all of these spaces and how to organize all of these things to I mean, I was just reading, uh, what is it called? Guy Debord, um, mm-hmm. Society of the Spectacle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah. Um, and just thinking about what that actually means, um, in the sense of like, media is like a, it's like a celebration of its own means of production, you know? Yeah. And, so if as a comedian or as a any other kind of artist i'm still going up and like and not challenging these institutions that i have been forced to come up in or i am challenging those institutions by just opening my own comedy club and then uh and then still having it be a hierarchical institution um Mm -hmm. then i'm not actually doing anything you know yeah. I'm, I'm just creating another offshoot. I mean, it's the same way every fucking rapper starts his own label because he got fucked over in yeah. or something. Like it's this, you know, it doesn't work that and way. It just does you know? the same shit. Yeah. Yeah. You don't just get to be the boss and now the problem is over. Um, yeah. Um, so I, I wonder how you think about this then. Like when you go and do a set, especially if you're someplace maybe like not, not in New York, mid sized city or whatever. I mean, what does that look like practically for you? Like when you enter a space to to perform and do something, like do you think to yourself, or I guess like how how do you think about balancing those ideals with the actuality of I need to make these people laugh for 30 minutes? I mean, I think what helps is not trying so hard to inject um the su- not trying to be so solution oriented just on mm-hmm. stage necessarily. Mm-hmm. Um, I think like I can kind of save myself the, uh, the pains of feeling like I have to solve everything in 30 minutes to an hour, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, and just kind of still just be funny, but with the, you know, with the context that I exist in, which is, you know, the like anarchists say living as though i'm already free and like Mm -hmm. at least just going up and pretending we already live in the world that i want to live in and speaking from a context that i was talking to my roommate about like i kind of like to backdoor my way into jokes and just kind of like pretend we're already on the same page Yeah, yeah, yeah i don't have to explain this shit to you you know you guys are intelligent you can catch up to me um and I, I, I just don't have to explain my whole worldview on stage. And also, I can also attempt, at least attempt to just be solving these problems off stage, you know, mm-hmm. organizing with the people around me, speaking to other comedians about their experience, um, uh, you know, rethinking who I work with. I, for the record, I just, I no longer have a manager because I found out my manager was a Zionist. That's what, okay. you know, we do, you got to do those things. Um, yeah, yeah. It's like, and creating the space where like, these ideas can actually be put into practice without without getting infected by other ideas that we know are bad. <laughs> You know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and we can just like 
be creative on stage without having to um without having to explain our whole political program and yeah. bore you with that. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I find that like some of this comedy, especially stand up I've seen recently that I find most affecting being an earnest human being expressing the way they're thinking about something and landing in such a way that like almost and I hate to over intellectualize the shit, but like it lands in such a way that it points out a very glaring contradiction in life in a way that a person who's not overly politicized would just feel um and can kind of like feel that oh shit things are weird in that way oh shit it is crazy um that i mean just off what we were talking about in the first hour of the show today like it's crazy that one guy has 30 billion dollars and then three million people don't have a place to live like that's just regardless yeah. of politics it is insane and i think creating spaces where people can i guess at least i've been thinking about art recently is like creating the space where people can sit in those moments it's probably more useful than being like, you got to read this book. Here's the good ideas. Um, you know, X, Y, and Z political programs are what you need to get down with immediately, which just kind of yeah. feels like giving people homework. Yeah. And there is a place for that, I think. Um, yeah. And I, think, I personally think the place for it is with when you're speaking to other artists, people who have to convey a worldview on stage. Like, I. Um, I only just started doing this and I only did it to one person who lived mm -hmm. with me. Um, like I've kind of, I think I'm going to give up on writing, like helping people write jokes. Uh -huh. uh, just be like, here, read this book and just interpret that. You know, it's like, I, I get very frustrated with the idea that comedians don't have to be responsible for anything that they say yeah um we kind of live in this weird liminal space where people we're like we fight for free speech everything we say is worth protecting but also it's just a joke it doesn't matter you know and so i get really frustrated with uh when i talk to a lot of people just because they just don't really know what the value of what they're saying is um yeah and and so I, I i don't know i just think like if you're going to be conveying ideas on stage and you're going to you're going to talk to people for up to an hour you should at least know what you're talking about and if you don't know what you're talking about at least be able to stand behind what you're saying be willing yeah. to defend it yeah and i don't want to like bring up like messy things right now but this this does make me think of a a, a comedy clip that, that went viral on twitter the other day that i know that you interacted with yeah. um in which in which a comedian just spouted like factually untrue things about the history of of palestine in a way that was like funny and you know yeah. like there are things like that that just make me think how how recklessly irresponsible one can be with a platform uh and presenting yeah. things in a way that are just like man you you could just read a book or not even read a book like yeah glance wikipedia and how quickly those things then become ideological tools for other to glob others to like glob onto and we saw you know a microcosm of that in in a clip in a response to it um, yeah and he uh, uh for the record i used to work with him yeah uh, uh i wrote on a show that he was on mm -hmm. and he he responded to me uh quote tweeting it and said like said all this stuff we uh, i gave you ride a ride home from set and i you know we used to talk about comedy and laugh and all that stuff and i'm just like that one that doesn't excuse anything mm -hmm. um and damn now i've forgotten what two is uh two is just <laughs> damn what was two <laughs> who was phone do you remember that move that meme uh <laughs> um i just i yeah i just um just generally speaking i i guess he said he said to me that it i i was piling on over over a bit a quote a quote unquote bit and i and that's the part that bothers me is that people are willing to stand up for what they believe in as long as other people agree and yeah and i 
And in that case, I'm like, okay, this might be a bit to you, but somebody believes this information. Somebody believes this is just cold information. You know, there like there's a reason uh my Bialik is posting a video of herself pretending to laugh for a second time even after she's seen the clip already you know what i mean it's just like really unhinged stuff and yeah and anyone yeah. just yeah if anyone wants to look this up uh look at my Bialik, uh it's grace former jeopardy host uh twitter thread yeah. or i know uh Yudoye, uh retweeted that as well but yeah like seeing stuff like that was just really upsetting and then just seeing the ways in which, like people take these things present it as like just yucking it up and then they get used as clear ideological tools. And it has been weird. Like during, during the current genocide, it has been wild to see the way in which, I don't know. I mean, I feel like we, we came through this era of, you know, when, when people were like in the streets in 2020, 2021, uh, you know, protesting for various things but it seemed like there was this this brief window where there was some sort of coalescing around acknowledging like you know systemic racism police violence the effect of you know capitalism all these sorts of things and coming out of the woodwork everyone seemed like they were free to to acknowledge to affirm and a lot of it was of course branding and stuff but the way in which that's backslid now where people have either like had to self-censor i mean the the amount of people I know too who I, in a similar situation to you who lost representation or had to leave their representation because of issues around this the way in which people have been like punished for posting things that are just like genocide is bad this is genocide human lives matter it, it just it's it's been really weird to, to to process and see all of that happening in real time and it's been especially weird to see how it's affected it seems like the stand up community in particular where it seems like a lot of very very famous stand-ups have been allowed to perpetuate, you know, uh, very harmful ideological myths while more like mid-level working comedians have been punished for expressing solidarity with humanity. And it's just been a bummer to watch. Yeah. Um, it, 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 it does bum me out. I think because I think in this context and more broadly, I think stand up has just kind of become an art form for um I don't even want to use the term bourgeoisie because people would mm. interpret that all all, the same, yeah. all the same ways. But it, it it has become it is kind of entered the echelon of like um of other arts where you're really celebrated based on how much money you make and how much power you can attain. Um, and people look to like the, the, the legends like Chappelle who, you know, who have coasted for 20 years off having integrity one time in their life. Um, And they, and they may or may not take another uh stand at another point in their career and walk one audience for saying some shit about palestine but then you never hear it you never hear about it again meanwhile the people that have an ongoing interest in these things and they're actively engaging with these ideas are 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 being punished because they don't have the influence that he does you know um yeah and it's 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 just a shame to have an art form that could represent um working class people or just not wealthy people having a say and uh and engaging in their day to day political matters um to have that turn into just like you know whoever has a TV show gets to talk for an hour yeah. Um, wow. Yeah. There's just not a. There's just not a. There's not a platform that reliably. Um, that one reliably uh, is willing to put on people at that caliber, and two that can do that without them launching them into another tax bracket and changing. Yeah, their yeah, yeah, yeah. Which like. You know, in our modern context, that is a good thing to be able to do that. 
Um, but like, I think, I think because of the way stand up is organized, where like, there's no union for stand up comics, but there is a union for TV writers and actors and all of these other career paths that stand up comics could enter if they want that there just can't there just can't really be any real solidarity among comedians mm -hmm. uh as such yeah you that know? there's like a sort of atomization baked in to to that community mm -hmm. and that that way of producing art yes uh there's a there's a good book by i think her name is madeline lane mm -hmm. mckinney called comedy against work Ooh. um that kind of that kind of gets into this stuff, but um, but just in the a, uh, her, her underlying idea is basically that stand up comedy mm -hmm. is sort of the quintessential oh, cool. cap capitalist work ethic. Yeah, which I agree with. You know. Yeah, I'm gonna check that out. I actually, I might remind me if if you're interested, I'm gonna send this to you later. Uh, I got I got like sent a an early you know PDF of some new book that's coming out on like comedy and politics. Um, that I guess I get to write like a blurb on the back if I like it that says pay money for this book, but it looks kind of interesting. So I know you like reading stuff like that. So, and I'll, if anyone watching the stream wants it too, I'll, I'll share it illegally. I'll share it illegally. I don't care. Um, okay. I want to, I want to wrap up with a couple positive things, but I want to give you space too. Is there anything that falls in the realm of just pure negativity? You feel like you need to get off your chest while you are here before I shift us into a space where I, I push us to be slightly, if not positive, uh, optimistic or hopeful. Um. Yeah, man. I just want to say, give up on your dreams, dog. There, we got a society that's run on exploiting people trying to uh, achieve dreams. You can do the you you can do the shit that you're dreaming about where you are. You know, you don't have to get famous off it to be uh yeah. to, to enjoy it. And I would argue that if you don't enjoy it without the fame, then maybe you're not supposed to be doing it in the first place. So, like, give up on that shit. People will uh, test your integrity no, but, at every point yeah. in your life. Um, I think that's very positive, though. That's like a positive message, because I think, like, especially for people that grow up in a, in a certain generation, at least in America, the connection between creativity and passion and, and commerce and income were just like this forever. And I think disconnecting those two does create a pretty big sense of freedom and, and a sense of like validation. Yes. And yes. I know, you know, that sense of like, you can do a thing. And even if that's not the thing that relates to the W2s and 1099s you have at the end of the year, that doesn't take away from you doing that thing, creating that thing and finding communities to do that thing. So, yes, you know, yes. that was, that was negativity that, that like opened up the door for positivity. Yes. That's my whole. That's my whole worldview, man. Put I gotta put wow. this negativity out of my body so I can neutralize it. You know. You gotta expel it. You gotta expel it. Thank you. Well, so what do you? In 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 the stuff you're thinking about, what do you see then? What what would a, what would a? I guess either like. What does art look like? What does communities organize around creativity look like? I know it's something that you think about. I know it's something you're working on. Like, what do you? What do you see down the road? Uh, what would you like things to to look like? uh basically uh globally federated art spaces and communities just like you know venues that actually support the communities that they're actually embedded in you know you don't have these these tourist trap comedy clubs mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. yeah into from fucking wherever the fuck germany um <laughs> Not, and I mean that in the least xenophobic way. I mean that it, they actually appeal to the people that live yeah. in those communities, which most of these venues do not. You know, um, there is nothing wrong with people coming in from out of town to enjoy comedy that will always exist, but just something that's actually embedded in the in the community that they claim to be a part of, um, yeah. and then those places being run by the people that actually do the work of comedy or music or whatever art that you want to put on there. Um, and then those places being in communication with each other on a national and then a global basis. Um, and having some semblance, semblance of like breakdown in these, uh, in these 
national restrictions based on uh based on bullshit borders and geography and all of these things um and also an integration of the what i think are really disparate art communities that's that's what that uh the comedy uh jam that you brought up was about yeah. because i i in the last year it started uh teaching myself bass and was like going out to these that, jams. that was my final question for today was going to be about you and bass so i'm glad you're getting into this for me yeah well so um i i mean i started playing when i was 15 but i gave it up for a long time but like just kind of as getting older, realizing that I don't have to make a career out of something ju uh, just to enjoy it. And so I started going out to these spaces and just like kind of integrating with the music community in Brooklyn and, you know, went to their shows. They've come to my shows and just realizing like we don't have to do all this stuff separately. We don't we can create yeah. a space where we can kind of uh, uh, transcend this like individualist uh mindset of success and just kind of like make some make moments together you know um yeah we don't have to make these little uh consumable nuggets of art to sell for a dollar 99 you know we can just like uh, be in space with each other and yeah and make i find that inspirational i you know uh i think there's a thing uh, not to be gendered here, but dudes of a certain age, I think a lot of people I know in the past two years have been like starting to play instruments again, like the yeah. things they played in high school or college. Um, a couple of years ago, I, I got really back into playing, found some friends who did. We started a band we've been playing. And like, I've had this huge shift where like, you know, however many years ago, so much of my creative time was like doing, you know, comedy or theater stuff. Um, and it always felt really depressing and I was always losing money on it started playing music in the past year and it's just so much more fun. And there's even this baseline I've noticed of like, I've, I've never, we've never played a gig anywhere, even like a shitty bar with 10 people there. We don't get like a little bit of money and like some yeah. drinks and snacks or something. And, yeah. and like the way in which anyone can participate in that, the feeling of like playing music and you see people walk in and just like vibe with it for whatever reason. Like I found that community and that world so much more fun and positive yeah. and of course you make a little bit of money which is which is nice that it's a baseline assumption in that world that if you're mm -hmm. going to do creative work we're at least going to give you like enough money to cover your gas and dinner yes um and also i i mean my baseline for for getting involved is like there's just a social element you know i realize i live yeah lived by myself for two years during covid and was still yeah. and started going back out to do stand up and realized like oh i've been by myself uh i go out go out to shows and i'm on stage by myself and then i could leave the room without ever speaking to somebody you know there's just like playing music it's like you got to communicate you got to like work the yeah. social rules you know it's like it's not yeah. just everybody learns their part and they play it and they're separate from each other, you know? Yeah. And not to be a hippie about it, but like, but to be a hippie about it, it is, yeah, it's that feeling yeah, of like that, one person a does a thing. Yeah. Hippie about Hell it. Hell yeah, dude. It's like, uh, one person does a thing. Another person responds to that thing. Next thing you know, five minutes later, you're just like doing, you're, you're doing something that no one would have thought of on their own. You're creating it in real time. And that just feels great. It, yeah. it feels so good. Uh, yeah. to be a part of that. Well, well, next time, you know, sometime when you're in L.A., you need to come and we should just do a stream from the studio. where We have some instruments and just talk shit while playing music passively. I, um, you know, I, I always feel we get set up. So before I let you go, if you're cool with it, tell us some things that are art, books, whatever that you're excited about, that you're enjoying right now. Oh, that, man. That people could check out. Um, look, I'm I'm finally finishing uh ecology of freedom by murray bookchin i've been working on it for what feels like three or four years at this point um and i'm finally i finally got the energy to wrap that up um i am shit i just i i just i get sidetracked when i'm reading pretty easily yeah. so i i just ordered a one of the one of those scholar bibles i've never uh -huh. finished 
I've never read the whole Bible. I figured, yeah. let me read it with all the apocryphal shit in it. Um, that, that stuff's real fun. It's weird, yeah. but it's fun. Yeah. You know, just to just to know, you know? I feel like there's yeah. so much context you miss when you don't know. Um, and I just want to know. I got a book about That's great. Jesus' brother. Because there's apparently, uh, there's like a sect of, this is all in Ecology of Freedom. There's, a, mm. I guess, the Jamesian sect of Christianity got suppressed by the Pauline sect of Christianity, which mm-hmm, was the, mm-hmm. author- the authoritarian papal side of it, uh, which is new, which is all new to me. I thought it was, I always wondered how it got like that, but I assumed it was just a natural progression from having a monotheist yeah. God or whatever. But oh, it was it was active, just like everything capitalism ever has ever done. The suppression was active. People would prefer the other thing. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, yeah, that's that's what I'm getting into now, and just like trying to get through Berserk. I'm trying to finish the Berserk manga. That's that's yes. that's all. I'm doing. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Well, also too, I still we need to create a space at some point where. We're launching like a second feed so we can make more stuff that's just focused on like anime, movies, TV, and stuff like that. So at some point, um, you know, might might need some some manga and anime takes from you that we can we can discuss in a formal setting. Oh you yeah, know? man. Because because why why read something and enjoy it if you can't get content out? Is what I always say. Yeah, man. You gotta you gotta get that content. <laughs> you got. I don't know how to live otherwise. You you um, can't just consume. You gotta consume other people's consumption. It's 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 like the human centipede model of consumption, and I love it so much. Yeah. Um, man, I'm gonna go cry a little bit. Well, dude, thank you so much for coming on. Like, really, really appreciate. It. Uh, it's yeah. just very fun to talk to you, and you know, always one of my favorite people to to watch anything that pops up, and you know, in, in my top five people. That sometimes on Twitter I have to be like, I can't fucking like everything he says. I gotta really, I gotta like save it a little bit because I can't just be like that. So, but if I could, I would like almost everything you say. Man, I appreciate that, dog. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it feels like, why am I even awake right now? Um, but I, I'm I'm glad to I'm glad to hear people enjoy these stupid little threads. I do. Uh, they do, and and I think you say the sort of things that I think for a lot of people, self included, uh, make people feel less crazy uh, because you are you are you are stating you're good at articulating a sort of like collective mood or the anxieties that float around various societal moods uh it's it's a real skill you have yeah thank you man and thank you for having me on again dog this is uh yeah. it's always cool to come on man you know I'll, yeah dude. You know, I'll watch your i watch your videos every now and then all the time uh and i, I there's a, i feel like there's a reason i am the way i am you're part of that universe where i'm like ah, i wish i had thought of it that way and now i have and now you know it just it, I don't know. That's, it's a goddamn do. honor. Um, but yeah. yeah, we gotta, yeah, definitely. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make you come to the studio and do something next time you're in LA. Cause that'd be fun. Um, yeah. You know, when, when the studios fly you out to pitch you on your participation in the DC extended universe. Hell yeah. Oh, Hell before yeah. I go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know you're talking about uh, Hank Green. Uh, yes. I don't, know, I don't know him personally, but John Green and I went to the same high school. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's, little that's a fun little fact i like to really like thread the needle and bring it all home um yeah. so you really helped us do that yeah i just gotta I just thought I'd, you know help you land this plane yeah hell yeah man. well everyone of course follow you on all the things if you are in new york check out the stuff you're doing there i know you're are you touring these days are you are you doing out of town, are you out of town um I'm I'm trying to get some tour some tour dates going i want to shoot a special this year um but we support that there is a there's a groundwork that needs to be done. Okay, well we support that uh, spiritually, and of course, uh, whenever um, you know some new jaded form drops, we'll be excited to see it. I'll make sure that we for all, all the wise track people out there, we'll make sure we post it so you see it. Truly, one of one of the best things that's been happening on YouTube in the last year. So excited to see what you guys do next. Hey, thank you, man. Awesome. Have a good rest of your day, dude. Thanks for stopping in. Too, man. See you. Hell yeah, well, everyone. Thanks again. Thanks for hanging out watching that. I know that sometimes, you, you know, Henry, I'm, you know how like George Clooney does the thing where it's like one for me, one for them. Yeah. I think sometimes, you know, guys, sometimes we got to have discussions like this that, you know, I might not be as active in the chat 
it, at that point of time, you know, we might not be exhibiting the tendencies of an ADHD fueled virality, but I think we got to have these discussions sometime. I think we, I think we balanced it well today. I think we had hour one, we had our more viral sexy YouTube topic in hour two, we really dug into it with an interesting person. So um, if you guys don't, you know, follow Doye, do that on the platforms. Uh, he does have one special. It's up on YouTube right now. You can watch. I think it's, I think it's a comedy central thing, but interesting person. Uh, that, was, that was, that was pretty fun. Right, Henry? Yeah, it's been an excellent program today. It's got me thinking a lot about just the concept of will and imagination in the way. Yeah. That, uh, what's going on with our politics guys it brings to mind a saying a friend of mine sohan he uh he's actually here on youtube as tea house ghost shout out to oh, hell China yeah. tea. he has a tea house here in austin um but just in regards to any anxieties you're feeling over authority or being punished or just like what you can or can't do within society there's a traditional chinese saying i remember him telling me and it is the mountains are high and the emperor is far away Wow. There is there is wow. a distance between authority and yourself, and you should consider that. Uh, just like power has a latency on the individual. And, uh, you know, figure out what you can do with that, because uh, you might be overthinking uh, what sort of uh, stresses and tensions are pushing on you structurally. Oh, that's great. Um, God, that was great. Uh, extraneous. Those are some good recommendations. And yeah, we're going to have some more people on. I need to do some follow-up emails, but I I have a couple of authors of some recent books that are like in the wheelhouse of stuff that I know you all like uh, that are going to come on soon. We're going to have some other stuff as well. So um, hit us up with the recommendations on that. Uh, Ann Porkins, glad that you like to chat, um, even as you just have your nose in the slop the whole time. So a couple of things before we, we head out. If you want to share any one of our um, thanks to all of you that are members and, and patrons. If you're not, that's fine too. I never want anyone to feel guilty like your support from being here from chatting from liking from leaving comments it means so so much if you have the money to throw around um consider joining the patreon patreon uh, we're making some more content there and then if you are patrons let us know in the discord or just on the patreon page as well and be like honest when we're doing new stuff let us know if you like it or not because i think all the new content we're making on patreon we're thinking y'all might like this stuff, but you're, you're the point. We're not the point. So just let us know if there's other stuff you want. If you want more of certain things, just let us know. Um, and one favor I'm going to ask you right now, and this is tough, but I'm going to do it. We put out a new video today. If you could go watch it when the stream ends, that would be dope. Henry, can you drop a link in the chat to, yeah, the, to uh, the, the is, art is gaming art. Yes. So we made a new video. It's on gaming and art. And we kind of, I'm going to be real blunt with you all. We need some people to watch this one. I know that sometimes we don't like the sponsorship thing, but that's how we keep the thing alive, you know, because we, we do the stuff and then we, we do things and then that's, we get the money. And then that's how we keep doing this stuff. So if you just, uh, Henry's going to post the link. If you could go watch that video, like it, leave a comment that says something weird. I, here's what I want you to do. Go watch the new video and leave a comment that Just only Henry it. or I will understand. Okay. It would mean a lot to us. So I want to see people leaving this now. I want the numbers to drop because I'd appreciate if you click that a guy that knows a little bit about it. will try to switch back to another issue and get in there. Watch it. Um, I want, and it's on art and video games. I want, it, there's a good video. There's some, is there some branded elements? Yeah, there's some branded elements. It is what it is. We live under capital the system i'm not i'm not trying to perpetuate i'm trying to survive okay so go watch it leave a comment do something like that even if the comment is like about one of my dads or something i don't care really appreciate it um and thank you so much again to producer Andy for making this happen thank you to Udelia travis for coming on thanks to hank green for you know what saying stuff in the world that we're responding to he's, he's a good good guy um and we just wanted to have a discussion on some stuff he says we'll be back next week right here for another Wisecrack Live, dry January is over. Let's get ripped, guys. We'll see you later. See you later, chat. Thanks for hanging.